it is, the abrupt intro ending. Welcome into the John Cass podcast. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. And it's brought to you as always by Ian's Pizza in Madison. They have three locations in Madison. They've got three locations in Milwaukee. They're in Seattle. They are in Denver. You can go check out their specialty slices of pizza. Check them out online, on Instagram, on Twitter. And if you've never been to an Ian's Pizza, what are you waiting for? Go have Ian's. My daughter just had some Ian's pizza this weekend, macaroni and cheese uh, at a volleyball tournament in Milwaukee. So mac and cheese is always a classic. Check out Ian's Pizza, johncastpodcast.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. I'm not going to spam you. I'm just going to send you like cool stuff, basically, like when we have cool guests or when we have cool promotions. So johncastpodcast.com is the place to go sign up. Also, drop in a rate and uh, a review on uh, this podcast, whether that's on Apple or Spotify. Those are super beneficial and really do help this program and, and the future of this podcast. So if you could go drop that in, that would be fantastic. I would appreciate it. Well, you've seen today's guest on Bally Sports Wisconsin, covering the Wisconsin uh, Milwaukee Brewers rather. And she was recently named the NSMA Wisconsin Sports Caster of the Year, the first female to ever win the award. Welcome Sophia Minert to the John Cast podcast. Hey Sophia, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Tell me about this award. What was that like when you learned that you were Sportscaster of the Year in the state? Um, honestly, it was a huge surprise. I First of all, it was an honor just to be nominated uh, the class this year. And I think this just reflects so well upon like the sports market here across the state, um, you know, to be with you know, my teammate Jeff Levering with the Milwaukee Brewers and Lisa Byington, who does such an extra excellent job with the Milwaukee Bucks. And then some local people here like Dennis Krause and Lance Allen, who have won in the past. Um, Jeff has won in the past as well. So I think it's just it speaks really highly, I think, of, you know, the caliber of talented people that are across the state. So that's a list that like you're just happy to be on mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're nominated with people like that. And then when they informed me that um, I won and that I was the first female to win it, um, I think that was an even bigger surprise. So obviously it's extremely humbling. Um, it was a huge surprise to me, but um, it's a very cool honor. Yeah, that is very cool. Almost all, I haven't had Dennis Krause on the podcast, but I think I've had almost everybody. I had Lisa on, I've had Levering mm -hmm. on. Uh, who was the other one? Uh, Lance Allen. Lance Allen, sorry, Lance. Yeah. I've had Lance Allen on and now I've had you on. So I'm, I don't know, man, that's a, that's a who's who of this state. I mean, but there are so, that's the thing. Like there are so many yeah. fantastic broadcasters, right? Totally. And I think that's why it's so humbling. It's like, yeah, you know, you look across and I'm like, man, <laughs> any of those people are absolutely so deserving to win. And then I think there's also so many people left off of that list that I think are just as deserving to win. I'm like, how's, you know, Brian Anderson, he's won, Matt right. LaPay, you know, it's like, yeah. there are so many deserving people. And, uh, you know, I consider myself really lucky that I've been able to work with a lot of these people um, in my time here in Milwaukee. So yeah, I just, I hope Wisconsin sports fans recognize that, not just for me, but I think about that a lot. Like, man, how lucky are we that we have you know, such great people covering, whether it's Badgers, Packers, Bucks, mm -hmm. Brewers, um, you know, for as much as Wisconsin people love their sports, <laughs> um, I think it's it's cool that we've got really great people covering them. I mean, Bob Uecker should probably win this thing like almost Bob, every year, I, right? <laughs> Paul, yes, Bob, like, you know, he's won every award um, a million times and he could win them all a million more times. I mean, you yeah. you can't say enough about what he does. Do you have many interactions with Bob? Like, yeah. You, you see him wave, yeah. say every, every hi day. or every day. Yeah. He's yeah. been um, incredibly supportive since day one um, of my time there. And I think that like is no small understatement because I, I don't work on the radio side, right? I'm on the TV side. And, and even so from the first day that I was with the Brewers, he was incredibly inclusive, kind, supportive um, when I joined the team full time in 2018, you know, that doesn't happen without Bob's support. And honestly, he's become a really good friend of mine, which sounds crazy, but um, you know, I just, I love talking about the game with him. I love hearing his stories. Obviously he makes us laugh every day. <laughs> so um, I, I definitely, it's been one of the highlights of, of my time with the Brewers, you know, just to have those interactions and that friendship with him and to have his support uh, means so, so much to me. I want to ask you about your broadcasting career, but mm -hmm. I feel like if I got to speak with Bob Uecker every day, 
I would have a permanent grin on my face, not only because I get to speak to Bob Euchre every day, because I'm just waiting. Like, I'm wondering, like, is he, is he telling, is, it, is this a joke? Is he being like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Like just waiting for like some funny little quip or something like that. Totally. And I think we all know how funny he is, but I, yeah. I think, I don't think he gets appreciated enough for like, honestly, what a comedic genius he is because so many of those things that he does, whether it's the movies, the Johnny Carson's, the commercials, what you hear from him on air during the games, like he doesn't script any of that. Um, that's just who he is. That's him. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know how you come up with half of this stuff, yeah. but um, you know, the stories he has, you're like, are these real? But they all are, <laughs> which is sort of just as unbelievable. So I really, I really think we shouldn't discount, especially at his age, like he really is just so sharp and bright. And mm -hmm. in my opinion, he, he really is like a comedic genius. One of the funny, well, he's had a thousand funny lines, but this is one mm -hmm. I tweeted in 2014. I just found it here. <laughs> uh, Bob Euchre during last night's Brewer, Brewers broadcast, our vantage point there at Pittsburgh, our vantage point here is about as high as you can get without smoking something. And yeah. I'm just like, oh my God, where'd that come He's from? not wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's way up there. It's definitely one of the high, I don't know if you've been to PNC Park, no. but he's not wrong. It's it's definitely one of the highest booths across the league and probably the only higher one is at, oh. um, at Nationals Park in Washington, D.C. Crazy, crazy. So how did you uh, get into sports broadcasting? Um, well, I grew up in Madison and, and my dad being the longtime head football coach at Edgewood, you know, I just, I grew up around sports and, you know, I tell people that if they've seen, remember the Titans, you know, that was how my brothers and I grew up, you know, we were running around the football fields and the weight room and the gym, and that's just what we did. And my dad, you know, included us in all of that and allowed us to be, you know, as active and, and participate in that however we wanted to. Um, you know, we all played our own sports. Um, it was just, to us, that was normal, um, you know, going to games every Friday night and being around the teams. And uh, that was probably my first introduction. And then through that, you know, you get to see, you know, local TV and, and local writers. And I was starting to get exposed to more of that. And I thought, well, that could be fun to do. Um, so probably was like middle school and high school that I started thinking about that seriously. Yeah. Um, you know, I started working in, in high school sports, actually when I was in high school, working for a production company and then writing for uh, the Wisconsin Sports Network website, you know, covering games. And then I went to Marquette um, with the idea of, of pursuing that as well. So I was a journalism and Spanish double major. Um, and even at that point, I wasn't necessarily sure I wanted to go into TV, but I knew that I wanted to be in sports and I wanted to be in media and I would figure it out. So, yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Um, all right. So you're, you're working or you, you do some, some work in, in high school mm -hmm. at that time. Did, did you have a specific like goal in mind or dream? I guess maybe dream like, oh my gosh, I want to be <laughs> blank in, you know, five, 10, 15 years or whatever the timeline would be. Would be. Yeah, honestly, I didn't like I didn't have, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, did you always want to work in baseball? And mm -hmm. even then, I wasn't really thinking about it um, in terms of what specific sport. I think people that knew me growing up are probably more surprised I'm not working in football, you know, that just yeah. considering how we grew up. But um, I think for me, I was which I think in hindsight was a really good thing that I wasn't fixated on a certain market or job or role that I think I was just open-minded about. I knew I wanted sports and I wanted to do media and I wanted to be in communications. I thought these are two things that I like and that I at the time thought I was okay at. And I'm like, I'll, I'll put it together. I don't know what it's gonna look like. I was pretty open-minded to, to print or web or radio or feature writing, um, television. So it wasn't really until I got to Marquette and then the summer between my junior and my senior year, I had the opportunity to intern at ESPN headquarters in Bristol, Connecticut. Wow. And I think that internship for me was what cemented like live television, you know, mm -hmm. being in that environment, um, working on those studio shows and getting to shadow people. I think that for me was what really drove me to, to TV and live production. 
I, I love that that approach, by the way, that it's like, I want to get into sports. Like you just kind of, yeah. you start with this wide base. You're like, I want to get into mm-hmm. sports. And eventually it funnels down to something specific for me. <laughs> it was opposite. I went for mass comm and I've always wanted to do radio play by play. Um, and so I always like in my head, I was like, man, I, if I could ever get an MBA job, that would be like, that'd be a home run. I don't care how much it pays. Yeah. I don't care, whatever. Like, that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I kind of like that, that approach where you just kind of like, I just get into sports and then I just kind of, you know, you bounced around and your path kind of settles into what your path is. Um, now you said you went to ESPN to intern, like yeah. what, what did you do as an intern at ESPN? What's that like? It was, it was amazing. Honestly, I, it's one of the best internship programs in the country. And I was really fortunate to meet, um, one of the ESPN executives when I was a student at Marquette, they'd come to do an event there with students at the College of Communications. Um, And so I was there the summer of 2008, which was actually a a pretty big summer to be there. Um, There was the Summer Olympics going on. And then it was also the summer that ESPN started transitioning to doing a live morning sports center, which to us now sounds crazy (laughs) because that's what we're used to. But, you know, sports center used to only be a prime time program and they would rerun it, you know, a million times in the morning. Well, That was the summer that they did that. So we were, I was in studio production. I was a production intern. So we were assigned um, different games every night that we were responsible for, um, you know, watching, logging the games, cutting the highlights, writing the scripts, turning those into the producers and the talent that were working on those respective shows. So we were working on um, SportsCenter, Baseball Tonight. Um, I had an opportunity to do a week with College Football Live later in the summer and What's really cool about the program too is that they really encourage you to you know be really proactive they're like email people set up meetings go shadow people like you're gonna get as much out of this as what you're gonna put into it so i you know shadowed a couple reporters Um, one of them specifically wendy nix was incredibly kind to me and supportive and i think i spent like almost a week with her Mm. so um that for me was great because just obviously that's a, a national stage, um, but just seeing kind of behind the curtain, how these shows come together to work with some of those people, to talk to them about their paths um, was really cool. And I think for me, just seeing that it was like, okay, like live TV is is something that I think I really want to pursue. And that's, that's what I did my senior year. Yeah, that's okay. That's crazy. So let me get this straight. So interns, by the way, I think it's amazing that 2008, they, they're like, hey, let's do yeah. this in the morning too. <laughs> I know. It's crazy to think about now because we're so used to it. But like at the time, it was a, it was a huge investment for them and it was, yeah. it was a huge deal. So, so, yeah. so, so the, the, the talent will be reading intern copy like for scripts that you wrote like or do they kind of like look at it and go like, okay, hold on, just, you know, and adjust it probably? They'll look at it. But essentially, like, I mean, you know. If you're doing baseball tonight or if you're doing a, a, a primetime sports center, you know, a late night sports center, they don't have necessarily have time to right. watch all of the events, right? So that's why our job is like pretty important. And, you know, there's a lot of production assistants that are responsible for this work as well of, you know, you have to really be accurate with what you're doing. You know, in the best case scenario, the talent has the time to go through, maybe watch the highlight or go through the script double check everything, right? Go through the pacing and whatnot. Sometimes you're, depending on the game, sometimes you're handing it to them cold, you know, or, or may, it may, may go to them cold and they don't have time to look it over. So, wow. you know, I think it was a really good lesson for us, you know, like even though you're interning, we were contributing, you know, fairly significantly um, to the shows in terms of, you know, we were responsible for putting together the video highlights and putting together the shot sheet and putting together you know, the, the information that the little stats in there for the talent. And then obviously their job is, is to deliver it and execute it. Um, so yeah, I mean, every, every show is different and, um, you know, I think in the best case scenario, they have time to go over it, but sometimes they don't and it's, it's a cold read and you hope that you get it right. That's crazy. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So can you take me behind the scenes uh, on a game day for you now at Bally sports, and, yeah. and you're there and you're getting ready for a game. Like, what is the prep work like for you as a reporter there? Because um, just in comparison, you know, for me, I, I I don't know if you know this, but I do play-by-play for Wisconsin women's basketball and Wisconsin volleyball. And so every week, you know, 
I approach it from that play by play perspective of getting, you know, the rosters and making sure I know a lot about the team and, and studying up. But what, you know, with baseball, it's an everyday grind. It's mm -hmm. a, a day and your role is different than that of a, of a play by play person. So what 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 is that prep work like for you? Yeah, I think um, you're, you're totally right. Like, you know, your kind of preparation when you're doing like a single game matchup, it's it's a lot of cramming, right? Because right, you're, right. You're diving into like a, a new roster and you're diving into matchups, right? And trends and kind of what what is the, you know, the setup for this game. And I think for us, it's a little bit different in that we've got a series, right? So storylines can play out over the course of a series. Mm -hmm. And then I think also just with baseball, so much of it of if it is driven day to day, you know? So I, I guess at the start of a series, I, I always spend time looking at the opponent um, and then just kind of what's going on with them. Are there any significant injuries? Who are the starters we might see in the series? Um, have they made any moves lately? Stuff like that. I'll talk to my the reporter on the other side if there's anything I feel like I want to know a little bit more about. Um, and then for us, you know, on on the home side, it's it's a, it's a lot of similar stuff. It's like what are what are the series storylines coming into this? Is there any news of the day in terms of roster transactions, injuries? Um, I'm typically working ahead. Um, you know, you never in baseball you never talk to a starting pitcher on the day of their start. Okay. So, for example, if if uh, Brandon Woodruff is starting game one and Corbin Burns is starting game two and then it's followed by Freddie Peralta in game three, I'm working ahead to talk to those guys maybe a day or two in advance of their start. Um, and I try to get them one on one that can be talking about their previous start, maybe how the month has gone. Maybe it's the matchup, the lineup, if there's anything health wise going on with them. Um, and then same thing with the position players. Um, you know, it's it's what have they done, you know, maybe in the previous series, the last week, the last month, are they working on things? Um, injuries, of course, roster moves drive a lot of the news for us on a daily basis. It's, it's honestly, it's just a lot of talking to people um, yeah. because I think you're always looking for, like my approach as a reporter in the game broadcast is what can I add? You know, so they're gonna cover what is happening in the game um, what's happening with the players, Rock's going to break down sequences, you know, all of that. So for me, it's like, what can I add? Is it something personal? Is it something that they were working on in early work with one of the hitting coaches? Is it a change that they made in their bullpen leading up to the start? You know, I, I try to kind of get in there and, and add some of those details. Um, and, you know, hopefully it's interesting <laughs> or entertaining or, or something, you know, it adds yeah. something to the story. So honestly, every day can look different. Um, and that's kind of the fun of baseball too, is like you can show up and things can happen before the game, during the game um, that might dictate what happens the next day. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So when you're talking to to someone to try to get you know gather information for a report later on in a broadcast, are you like, are you do you take notes? Do you record mm -hmm. them so you don't miss anything and transcribe it or listen back or how does that process work? It's it's a combination of all the things. Um, I, I I like to try to talk to guys one on one if I can. Mm -hmm. um, if not, you know, we do a lot of like kind of mini scrums with like the writers and I. We talk to Craig Council both before and after every game. Um, you know, I, I might try to grab coaches on the side as well. So um, I, I do let the players know, like if it's a sit down interview or if I'm grabbing them one on one, I'll record it on my phone. Um, then I use an app that actually helps you transcribe it in real time. So then I can go back and go through the script and then kind of pick out sound bites I might want to use oh, that's or, awesome. or that's follow so up cool. on it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great app. And then I also, I mean, I always have my notebook with me, like what reporter doesn't. So right. that report, the, the, the notebook and my phone are basically never out of my hand um, unless there's a microphone in there. So <laughs> it's a lot of juggling of all the three things. But yeah, I'm, I'm constantly kind of writing little notes to myself um, or, or recording things on my phone. And then I go back and listen to it. And that's what helps me pick out sound bites for our shows as well. Mm. Um, so that I've got recordings of all of that. And Sometimes it's even just notes of like, ooh, I, I want to follow up with this player on this for the next day, you know, or or that's a good question to ask Craig. Or maybe, um, you know, maybe Christian was talking about something in his early work and I want to go ask um, Connor Dawson about it, you know. So it's, it's constantly trying to, um, you know, keep up with the information every day. 
Hmm. And so then when, when you go on a broadcast uh, at Valley Sports, how do you determine like when they'll go to Sophia and mm -hmm. what the content will, is that all, is that more storylines too? Like throughout the game, I guess some of that probably is right throughout the game. If things happen, then, then yeah. they go to you for certain reporting, but maybe some of the predetermined things, is that, how does that, how does that get set up or how does that, how do you guys figure out the content yeah. that will be on the air? Yeah, that's a great question. So like for our Brewers Live pregame show, that's that's kind of a predetermined format that we collaborate with on our producers. So, you know, it's that show starts 30 minutes before game time. And so, you know, the booth will usually contribute something. I will usually contribute a different storyline or maybe it's a sit down interview with somebody. Um, and then same thing, we've got 10 minutes to fill before first pitch. So booth will do a segment um, of our open and then I typically do a segment of our open as well. And again, we're kind of at that point, we're just setting up the game. Um, and then usually kind of right away in the second inning, sometimes third inning, I'll do a storyline right off the top, whether it's news of the day, something we didn't cover in the open, maybe it's about the starting pitcher, um, you know, say it's Brandon Woodruff, maybe we're, I'm, I'm recapping a conversation I had with him or something he was talking about before that start. And then within the game, like I send our producers an email essentially, and I, I include our announcers in that as well, hopefully before first pitch. Um, <laughs> I send them a list every day yeah. of kind of like what my storylines are, what my topics are of, okay, here are the, the topics that I can cover within today's game, whether it's news, conversation, um, something from a coach, a stat, whatever. Um, and then I coordinate with them of like, maybe there's a graphic I want to help support it. If we have any video or photos to use to support it. Like for example, if, if uh, Christian or one of the other position players is doing early work with the hitting coaches and I can add to that, um, you know, I might ask the truck, okay, can you clip off some of their early work? Okay, here's a look at earlier today. Hmm. Here's what they were working on. Hopefully that translates to the game. Um, so a lot of it's just honestly live. It's, it's a lot of me talking to the producers in the booth during the game of like, Hey, Willie Adamas is leading off the next inning. I can add here, um, or, Hey, we're doing a pitching change. This might be a good opportunity to talk about the bullpen status or maybe a roster move. So the game will honestly dictate a lot of what we talk about, as you know, um, yeah, you, can yeah. do all, you, you can do all this preparation. You think yeah. you've got it you've got all these great ideas and then the game, um, the game will, will dictate otherwise. So yeah. you, you, you know what that's like. Exactly. All of a sudden the story, I mean, this, the game always will take over. It seems, um, yeah. you ever, did you ever want to do play by play? I get that question a lot. And honestly, no, um, really? I, yeah, I, I have been encouraged to do it by a lot of people and I just, I, I feel like it's one of those things you really have to want to do. Mm -hmm. I personally just don't have that burning desire. I love, love, love to see so many more women get the opportunity to do it mm -hmm. um, across any sport. And I think it's great. I think we need that representation. I, I, I love to see it. <laughs> I hope more people continue to pursue it. Um, I personally just don't, I don't know. I just don't have a desire to do it. I have a lot of respect for that position. Um, of being the lead voice on the broadcast. And I've been really lucky to work with what I think are some of the best people across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and Brian Anderson and Jeff Levering and Matt LaPay when he was working with us um, and seeing how they work, um, how they prepare. Uh, it's it's great. You know, I, I, I consider myself really lucky to be able to do that. But I, I'm not going to say like never, but yeah. um, for now, that's like not really part of my plan. Yeah, never say never, right? Never say never, yeah. Um, okay, I wanna ask you about something that happened during your career mm -hmm. uh, while you were reporting. You probably know where I'm going with this. this. <laughs> you know exactly what this is. Um, at yeah. one point, uh, there's a there's a clip out there on YouTube and you're you're reporting, you're holding the microphone. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what where you are. I think you're on the first base. Uh, first base, yeah. First base line, okay. And you're reporting and all of a sudden, Bam! Out of nowhere, a baseball mm -hmm. knocks the microphone. I mean, it's right next to your face, and yeah. the microphone goes flying. I think you pick up the microphone and you just keep going like nothing, 
like nothing happened. Yeah. It was, it's the greatest clip ever. <laughs> um, do you, but my, I guess my question is uh, thoughts on that overall and just kind of yeah. the reaction people have given you throughout the years. And number two, do you report differently now during games because that happened? You know, like I got hit in the face with a volleyball once um, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just it's one of those things where I'm like, I was setting up and I was like, so I'm turning around, bam, volleyball. I'm like, well, now I know I'll never, you know, set up the same when <laughs> volleyballs are being, you know, hit around me. Um, so do you do you do you approach it differently because of that? Yeah, I guess I um that that's a good question because I never thought about it in that context. But um, yeah, so that was the 2013 season, which was actually my first season on the sidelines. Oh, wow. And, and um, it was Gene Segura. He was the shortstop at the time. And I was bringing us back from break, talking about something. And Gene just let one of his warm-up throws, I think probably the last one, because we were coming on live, he just let it fly. And the best thing that happened of that entire scenario is that the ball actually bounced. I think before oh. it hit me. So it like ricocheted like right b before our camera well, which at the time didn't have any netting. So this was another thing. There was no netting at the time. Okay. So it, it flew into our camera well. And then what you see, it's like that perfect storm that you could never recreate again. Right. Um, of, you know, I was on camera talking mid sentence, this ball fl flies in, knocks the microphone out. I'm thinking like, I don't even know if this microphone works. And I didn't even know if I was on camera. So I was like, I'm just going to keep it up and, and keep going because I didn't know what else to okay. do. Yeah. So and I so I just picked it up and kept going, but I didn't even know if the mic was on. And so I wrap up and I send it back to the booth and BA and Rock are just like, are you okay? They're like, <laughs> no, they're like, they're like, forget anything you just said. They're, I think they stopped paying attention. I think they were just like so freaked out by what yeah. happened. Um, so I, honestly, I was very, very lucky that I was not hurt. Um, but some things have changed since then. That was 2013. So we now have some netting down in that camera well. Um, and you are still partially exposed because yeah. obviously the photographers and our TV camera need to capture uh, the game. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, look, anytime you're on the field, anytime you're in those camera wells, you really have to look alive all the time, um, which is hard because sometimes you're multitasking as you're reporting, right? You're... I'm scoring every game. I'm looking at my notes. I might be looking something up for my next report. Um, I might be trying to pull up like a soundbite or something. So um, there's a lot of multitasking, but I try to always be really cognizant of like when the ball is in play. And um, cause yeah, some of my friends have suffered like serious injuries mm. um, being down on the field. And um, I've definitely had a lot of close calls there's a lot of ricochets, um, a lot of foul balls. I mean, bad throws. You, you name it, it, it can happen. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's gonna be an interesting time down there. It's probably what would be uh, baseball would probably be like on the field would be the one of the most dangerous, right? I mean, yeah, basketball, whatever, football, you might get yeah. ran into by somebody, not you know, like a player, but that'd be like more during a game sequence. But man, it's it's yeah. probably and really football. There's so much more room, right? Like you right, can right. spread out and you're mobile. And I think with baseball, what's hard is like you're so close to like basically our our positions are we're either on the home plate side or we're on the base side. Mm -hmm. So either way, you're really close to foul balls, um, foul balls, bad throws, and and some of those. I mean, the speeds on these on these <laughs> balls, it's like crazy um the exit velocity and how strong these guys are so yeah you definitely have to um be really careful when anytime you're down on the field yeah um from a report i have a few questions i want to ask you about the brewers off season uh mm -hmm. in a second i know they they've signed some players through arbitration avoiding arbitration rather um but but first uh what was i going to ask you okay so for me I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail of, of my broadcasting career because why not? Okay. Um, so I, for like 16 years, I, I did a sports talk radio job in Madison, partially in Milwaukee. Um, and I did play by play for Wisconsin volleyball, later Wisconsin women's basketball. So for me, it's like a full time job that was number one. And then I would prepare for my broadcast number two. And and, you know, depending on how much time left. I had left in the week because you know I have a life too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wait, what was that? <laughs> right. I would uh I would attempt to, you know, put the rest of my my 
my focus into that. Uh, I got let go from my job in June or July of 2021. And what I was able to do is I was able to like laser focus in on this play by play. Mm -hmm. And I started adding things that I hadn't done in years. And I was like, oh, well, I can do better at this. You know, I can get better here. And then I just, you know, I, and I started thinking, you know, if I do one thing a month, two things a year, two, three years down the road, all of a sudden there are going to be more weapons in my arsenal of how mm -hmm. I can describe something or how. Um, so that's what I've been really focused on over the last two seasons is just like, okay, how can I say this differently? What can I add to the broadcast? So I guess my question is, do you do those types of things or, or, or what are you doing to try to, to get better and better? Um, because, you know, if you look at your career in the, in the long term, we're just, we're in like, what, the, the second inning? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you got a I lot, hope so. <laughs> you got a lot left. So I, what are well, you doing yeah, to get I, better? <laughs> I hope so. Um, yeah, it's crazy. So this is going to be my 11th season, um, which when I say that out loud, I'm like, whoa, um, it just feels like a big number. Um, but I, I do think about like, I hope I, you know, I hope I've gotten better <laughs> in that time. And I think a big part of it just comes from like preparation, repetition, like anybody else, right? Just building up experience, all different kinds of scenarios when things go wrong. Um, when you have to like really, you know, ad lib or be on your feet and, you know, just perform, right? I mean, ultimately that's what live sports is. Like at the end of the day, it's, you have to perform um, regardless of what role you're in. So I, I do hope I've gotten better. Um, I think I, I always ask for feedback, whether it's, you know, the guys that I work with, who again, I have so much respect for, um, for how ridiculously talented they are in their roles. So like, we'll talk about things um, about, okay, well, we could have done this instead, or like, this was really good how we did this. Maybe this is something we should try to do again. Um, you know, this is, you know, maybe that didn't really work the way that we thought it would, would. like, what should we try that again? Um, and then I also, I mean, I love watching other people, you know, mm -hmm. I, I like, I, and I, I say that to students or, or people that are kind of just starting out as well. It's like, to like actively watch and listen, right? To pay attention to, okay, how are they setting things up? How are they doing transitions? How are they um, asking questions? What kinds of questions are they asking? What kind of questions get the best responses? Um, I like, you know, so I, I record everything. I, I like to go back and watch some things sometimes. Uh, that can be extremely humbling. <laughs> Um, I think it's like, I think it's personally, it's like torture to go back. I don't know how you feel. I think it's torture to go back and like watch or listen to something, but it's a good exercise to do. Cause I think then you also become aware of any bad habits or bad tendencies or things you might be getting stuck on. So yeah, I, I'm always thinking about that. Um, and it's sometimes hard to do just with like the volume of games that we have. Um, I think that's also kind of the beauty of it of like, okay, if my open doesn't go great, if I don't like how an interview went, mm -hmm. you're sort of immediately forced on to the next thing. Um, and that's actually what Craig counsel tells the players all the time. And I think I've heard it so often. I've like just applied it to myself. <laughs> I don't think he meant the message like for me, but, right. um, it's true. You know, it's like, we always kind of joke, we're still waiting for our first perfect game. So, um, yeah, you're just when you mess up, like yeah. acknowledge it and and you're forced to move on to the next thing because the next thing is usually coming up pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's I hate messing up. Um but you said it's torture sometimes to, to watch yourself. That's something I do try to do as well. I try to listen back yeah. uh and just, you know, recognize like, "Hey, you're saying that too much. Stop that." Or, "Ooh, that was yeah. nice. Why don't you say mm -hmm. that more often?" or things like that or slow down or you're, you know, yeah. uh, and I think that's, I think that's probably important. It's kind of like a uh, player watching game film, I guess, in a way for broadcasters, right? It's just kind of like totally. back and, and trying to see, trying to see where you can get better. So I'm all about that. Um, all right. Let me ask you a little bit about the Brewers off season moves. Mm -hmm. um, it, 10 players agreed to one year contracts, including, I'll just, let me look through this list. Uh, Willie Adamas, Ra Rowdy Telez, Keston Hira, um, Devin Williams, Brandon Woodruff, those are some big names still waiting on yes. Corbin Burns. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that can be resolved uh, shortly. Um, but what do you kind of think of what the Brewers, they haven't done much in the offseason. Um, mm -hmm. 
how is that going to translate? Because man, things get started and what are we in? It's going to be like a month, right? Or yeah, something like a month. Yeah. <laughs> it goes so quick. Cool. It comes up so fast. Yeah. I, look, I think, I think everyone was disappointed with like how last year went, you know, to not make it into the postseason, and, and that would have been really cool to do it for a fifth straight year. Um, they finished one game out, which mm. is as I, I know for fans, that's, you know, maddening and frustrating. And you're like, Oh, what if, and, you know, what could have and should have, and you know, all of that. You know why, you know why it's frustrating too? It's because it's baseball and they have 162 <laughs> and you can go look back and you can find a dozen games in which you should have won because yeah. it's just mm -hmm. the oddity of baseball and there's so many opportunities. And that's, I think what makes it even more frustrating for that sport. I'm sorry, continue. <laughs> no, but you're, no, but you're so right. And I, I mean, yeah. You go back even before the postseason run, the year before 2017, it was the same story. They finished one game out of the final um, wild card spot. And so it was the same story this year, right? They finished one game back of that final spot, um, which is hard. But I think for fans, it's also a lot of reasons to be optimistic. You know, the core of the team is back. They, they did lose a couple regulars uh, in the offseason, like Colton Wong and Hunter Renfro. But for the most part, the position, Omar Narvaez is too. Um, he left the team. So look, like the core of the team is back. And that was you know, what you're just talking about with arbitration. That was a huge piece for them to get kind of resolved because, you know, starting the, starting the off season, that was like the majority of their active roster was going into arbitration. So to get all those contracts cleared up is great. Um, the position player group is going to be relatively the same. Um, you're going to see some of these prospects come up, like what we got to see with Garrett Mitchell um, in the second half of the season. You'll probably see Bryce Terang at some point this year, which will be really fun. Um, and then there's some other great prospects like Sal Freelich and Joey Weimer down there as well that we might get a chance to see. And then, of course, like, you know, the strength of this team is pitching. We We yeah. all know that. So... Brandon, Corbin, Freddie, um, you get Wade Miley back. He was a, a fan favorite from the 2018 team. And then you've got, you know, they've got a lot of options with Eric Lauer and Adrian Hauser and Aaron Ashby. So, look, those guys are as good as any group across the league. Um, if they can stay healthy and if they can perform, there's there's no reason for fans, you know, to lose any optimism. Mm -hmm. Um. Was it Triple A doing an automated automated strike zone yeah. in twenty twenty? That's coming to baseball. Mm -hmm. That's gonna. I wonder. Number one, how do you feel like? Will that be something where every pitch? And I, I guess this is what they're trying to determine, right? Every pitch will be reviewed, and it is what it is. Or, or will you be able to challenge a pitch? Like, no, I don't, I don't like the call. And then you go and you see the. Mm -hmm. But that's coming to baseball. That's gonna be kind. Of, that's gonna be not kind of different. That's gonna be. Yeah. very different for a game as old and established with its rules and procedures as baseball. Yeah. Well, and look, there's, there's a, there's rule changes coming to major league baseball this year too, right? Yeah. With, we're yep. going to have a pitch clock, which um, they've been using that in the minor leagues. And, and by all accounts, it's been very effective there in terms of pace of play, which I think everyone is in favor of. Um, I, you know, I think they hope that that translates to a better fan experience and I think it, it'll just make the games better, too. And so the, sh the defensive shift is going to go away as well. That's been eliminated. They hope that that's going to lead to more offense. Um, they're expanding the base sizes, which is yeah. kind of more of a safety issue, but like could lead to more guys getting on base as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do think the game's going to look different this year, um, which I think we're all anxious to see how that looks um and what yeah. that feels like to all of us who are in it every day <laughs> and then yeah just recently that news about in triple a the automatic ball strike system i'm not sh totally sure on how the challenge system works i don't think you can challenge every pitch no. i think there's a limit um i think there's a limit on how many challenges you can have just like with replay right in the game um you only get so many challenges for that as well so I'm not totally well versed on on the rules for that yet in AAA, but look, that's that's how baseball has done things these last couple of years. Is you try it in the independent leagues and you try it in the minor league system before it ultimately comes to the major league game, because um, then you hope that you've got like enough of a sample size to know kind of what the how the changes could impact the game. The, the pitch clock to me is going to be, uh, and I'm not exactly sure the time uh, allowed and, and how, 
you know, what is constitutes like you, you didn't fall within those parameters because the one thing that, you know, it's kind of like a thought experiment we've, we've I've done on the radio before, like thinking if they go to a pitch clock, I hope it doesn't ever get to, and I'm not saying this will be like this next year, but I hope it doesn't ever get to like, you have to look at a replay and did the ball like leave his hand or did his foot oh. get on? Like, was he set before mm-hmm. and like how much time? And no, no, he missed it by a tenth of a second. So he technically wasn't set. I hope we don't get too technical. But then at the yeah. same time, if you don't specify exactly the time, you know what I mean? Like, then you're like, well, what's the point of the rule if you're not going to enforce? I don't know. I just hope we don't get too technical with it. I guess my overall point is. Yeah, no, I, I think like those are all legitimate questions, you know, because we have we have not seen it yet at the major mm-hmm. league level. Um, we're going to get a good dose of it in spring training. Uh, so I think, you know, by the time the regular season comes around, all of those things should be ironed out. And look, the players have known that this is coming for months now. So I'm kind of curious to see if it has affected their off-season training, specifically once they get into throwing like bullpens and live BPs, right, of simulating game action. Like, okay, I, you know, a guy like a Brent Suter <laughs> or Wade Miley right. has never needed a pitch clock. No. Um, for some guys, it's going to be a big adjustment. And I think specifically for relievers later in games, that's typically when the game slows down, right? Those are really critical at bats and innings when you're trying to lock a game away. So I think that's when you most often see a game slow down or with runners on base. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, I mean, the, the the evidence is there that it has helped pace the play in the minor leagues. So I think it'll be kind of good to see that adjustment in the major league side. All right, final questions for you, Sophia. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Mm-hmm. These are, it's random question time. Okay. Some baseball, some <laughs> non-baseball. Okay. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. So we'll start with baseball. Your favorite moment as a reporter covering a team. Is there a favorite moment? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's um, the 2018, the game 163 at ah, Wrigley yeah. Field. Yeah. Yeah. I think because that 2018 season was just so like magical. I know that sounds corny, but just how that whole season played out, kind of this wild run in September and, and kind of Christian locking up the MVP mm-hmm. and and then tying the Cubs right who had been like the top of the central since that World Series run and and to win 163 at Wrigley and in baseball terms relatively convincing fashion uh was just so awesome like it, and it was the start of what we saw the next couple seasons so I'll mm-hmm. always remember 163. Okay 163 good answer uh what was your favorite game like recess game or FIAD game to play in grade school? <laughs> oh my God. Um, I'll go first. Kickball. It was, okay, the, kickball it was just the one. best. It's yeah. always in Southern Minnesota. We were playing kickball every recess, man. Okay. Kickball. That's a good one. I'm going to go with four square. Cause I remember we had a bunch of like those four square games, like spray painted on the cement in like the playground. So yeah, I'm going to go with that one. I feel bad. I missed four square. I never played four square as a oh. kid. My daughter, like, you know, during the summer, she's like, let's play four square, drawing it on the thing. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but okay. <laughs> I've seen kids at her school play it before. I feel, I feel like I missed out not being able to play four square. You did. I did. Uh, best social media app. I like Instagram right now. Um, you know, Twitter's obviously gone through a lot of changes. And I think Instagram, you can, it's fun to follow people. Um, it's got its own issues, but I think you can get a mix of like news and entertainment, funny memes, sports highlights. Um, I think you can, you can kind of get a lot uh, in that app. So. Yeah, I, I hate them all. Um, <laughs> That's <laughs> fair. I mean, Depending on the day, that's probably the right answer. But you're right. Instagram probably is my favorite too. Twitter is just Twitter and Facebook, man. I, I find myself going down rabbit holes that I, I catch myself going, I don't need to be here. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not in this argument. Bye. Yeah. You know, and I have yeah. to leave. Um, so I'm not on TikTok yet. I don't know. I probably got all my information on my phone anyway now, but I just I don't know. Instagram for me, probably because it feeds me dog videos. Yeah, and exactly. So I'm exactly. like, I'll I'll go to the place with the cute dogs, I guess. Um, would you quit social media if I gave you $100,000 a year? Oh, man. Um, I would love to. Listen, I would I would love to quit. But unfortunately, like in 
these jobs, you know, it's Mm -hmm. sort of a necessary evil of, um, you know, obviously it's like sharing content, but also I think just as importantly, like consuming content, right. Of what other teams and media people and highlights and what's going on and all that. Like there is some value to it. Um, so can I, uh, retire first and then I'll take you up on your offer to quit yeah. social media. <laughs> That'd be the best. I mean, cause yeah. you grew, you grew up probably, what you say 2008, you were an intern. Um, so you grew up in two thousands, late nineties, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you, you were kind of I'm technically I, a millennial. I'm the dreaded millennial. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, but that's actually kind of funny because like that was how I started at Fox. Well, Fox Sports Wisconsin at the time was social media. Like people kind of oh, forget that, okay. that I was started out doing. Mm. I basically helped launch like their, their Facebook, their Twitter, their Instagram, because all those things were relatively new and they wanted the broadcast to start incorporating yeah. these social media elements but they didn't really have a plan for how to do that. So when I first started with the Brewers, that's what I was doing. I was doing social media content okay. uh, for the network. And and then I started, that's what I was contributing to the broadcast before I was ultimately reporting. Oh, okay. um, and all, I mean, going back to what we were talking about before with like the path, right? Like I would have never expected that social media would be my introduction to regional sports, you know, like that was mm. not part of the plan because it didn't exist. You know, right. it just, now there's all these platforms that offer so many more opportunities. Yeah. Uh, my dream is to go back to the nineties when I could not have to be bothered by anyone. And I just did stuff, <laughs> you know, and if someone yeah. wanted to talk to you, like you'd eventually get around and you'd give them a call, but it wasn't like the second they wanted to talk to you. Now I stop everything I'm doing and now I'm on your time. I, I, I sometimes want to go back to the 90s. Um, two more things. Best TV streaming service. Oof. Um, man. Okay, well, I, would, I would say, I don't know if this counts as a streaming service, but I love Apple TV and Netflix, I think, are the two, the two top ones for me. Yeah. Is there a series that you're watching right now? Honestly, no. Okay. I need to find a new series. Um, I'm open to suggestions, but yeah, I need I need to find a new series. Okay. Specifically, as I get to spring training, because like we've got you know we're we're gonna be there for a while. So okay, so I'm gonna get this clip. I'm gonna put it on Twitter, and we're gonna ask people to give you <laughs> recommendations for what to watch. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, I'm open. Okay. Uh, final question for you: What is your advice to anyone, whether that's male or female? trying to get into the broadcasting or thinking about getting into broadcasting journalism, that world, what advice would you give to someone who's just either thinking about it or just entering that world? Um, Well, first would just be to like say yes to as many opportunities as you can, because I think that when you do that and you expose yourself to a lot of different things, even things that you think you might not be interested in, um, you figure out pretty quickly, like either, yes, I do like to do this and I want to do more of it, Or what is just as valuable, in my opinion, is to also rule things out, you know, to be like, "Mm, that's not for me. I don't like it. Um, I'm maybe more interested in this other area. I think there's a lot of value in that. So I think just saying yes to as much as you can um, commit to it. You know, it's not easy. Uh, The hours are crazy. Um, You're going to be living on a different schedule than the rest of the normal world, so to speak. but if you if you like it, I think it's ultimately worth it. But it just it all starts with saying yes to as much as you can and and doing as much as you can and learning as much as you can and and be nice while you're doing it. Oh, there it is. That's a really key. That's a yeah. really key kind. Be nice. Yeah. I mean, it's so simple, but like for some reason, I think some people kind of miss the boat on that one. So yeah, if you're if you can be kind and nice and grateful um, while you're doing all of those things, I feel like good things happen. Absolutely. Well, congratulations once again, the NSMA Wisconsin Sportscaster of the Year, the first female to ever win that award. Sophia, thank you so much for taking uh, some time today to talk to me about that and about your career. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was a fun conversation. Awesome. All right, there you go. That is Sophia Minert of Valley Sports Wisconsin. Thanks to list, uh, thanks to you for listening to this podcast. Once again, brought to you by Ian's Pizza. Three locations in Madison, three locations in Milwaukee. Check out 
Ian's Pizza, johncastpodcast.com. Sign up for my newsletter. I'm going to tell you when cool things are happening with this podcast and a rate and review on whatever platform you're listening to this on truly benefits the podcast. So thank you if you've done that already. And if you haven't, it takes a few seconds. I'd really appreciate it. Once again, thanks for listening to the Johncast podcast. See ya.